Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Trust and Believe. I'm your host, Sean T. And today, I'm going to enhance your ability to trust and believe with two amazing guests that diabetes is a reversible condition. I want you to sit back, relax. Every single one of us out there knows someone who is suffering from diabetes or who has suffered. And I do believe that we have two amazing guests that's going to help us find a new way if you haven't heard of a new way already. So get ready to trust and believe. Somebody say, oh yeah. No, no, no. What's up? It's better than Oprah. Come on, y'all. This is Sean T, and it's time to trust and believe. Before we begin, I'm going to read the bio of these two amazing gents that I have on the screen. If you're watching on you, you should actually go watch on YouTube because they're very handsome, I must say. Hope, hopefully I'm allowed to say that to you guys. Thank you, sir. I appreciate um, it. Uh, they're also very intelligent and really, really smart, which you're about to find out. Cyrus Kambada, PhD, and Robbie Babaro, MPH, are the co-authors of the New York Times best-selling book, Mastering Diabetes, and the co-founders of Mastering Diabetes, a coaching program that teaches people how to reverse insulin resistance via low-fat, plant-based, whole food nutrition. Cyrus has been living with type 1 diabetes since 2002 and has an undergraduate degree from Stanford University. Okay, come through. And a PhD in nutritional biochemistry from UC Berkeley. I'm like, I feel like I'm in the presence of royalty today. <laughs> And Robbie was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2000 and has been living a plant-based lifestyle since 2006. He worked at Forks Over Knives for six years and earned a master's in public health in 2019. Uh, welcome to the show. How are you guys feeling today? Life is good. Life is good. We totally appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today because I feel like there's there's a lot of confusion online these days there's a lot of i mean everywhere you go whether it's instagram or youtube or TikTok, you name it it's like everyone's telling you i have the answer to your problems i'm a health expert you should listen to me you should buy this thing you should buy this supplement you should buy this product and it's like your average person has no idea what is real and what is not real so part of what we like to do is just trying to like cut through the confusion and provide clarity so that way people can walk away from a conversation and be like, oh, okay, like that sounds very reasonable. I understand that there's like a, a scientific basis to these arguments. I can use this information to improve my quality of life. I love that already giving people hope. And Robbie, what about you? I'm just excited to be here. Sean, it's an honor to meet you. I mean, I did insanity Aww. so many times. <laughs> I'd bring my laptop, lived in Santa Monica back in the day, take my laptop, bring it out into the, the park right in front of the beach, Put it on the on the, like the the picnic table. Do the workout outside. It was just great, man. So I appreciate you. I'm grateful for your contribution and just excited to be here. Oh, thanks. And I always say to every one of my guests that have done insanity, I'm like, wow. And you still want to talk to me? Like that's really <laughs> good because it is literally hell on earth for anywhere from 30 minutes to 59 minutes of your life of your day. So. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. All right. So I think I just kind of want to start by you guys telling me your experience of going through the journey. And obviously, both of you have had type 1 diabetes for a while or at least diagnosed with it. And I kind of want to go to the foundation of each of you only because there might be people out there who have been to the doctor and they say they heard like, oh, you're pre-diabetic or maybe they just found out. And so I think it might help people or people that they know kind of come to grips with it in the foundation of, you know, maybe their diagnosis. For sure. For sure. So um, <clears throat> I was diagnosed with three autoimmune conditions in 2002. Uh, and so I was born in 1980. By the time I was 2002, it was, you know, a uh, 22-year-old kid. I was just trying to graduate. I was a senior, and I was just trying to, you know, move on with my life and pretend like I was a productive member of society, right? And um, my mom tells me from, like, way back in the day that I was, uh, I was kind of like a hellcat from a young age. So by the time I was, like, four years old, maybe, uh, she just couldn't contain me. I mean, I was, like, 
I was breaking windows. I was just like playing baseball in the backyard. I was just like running around doing whatever. So she would enroll me in like soccer practice and then baseball and then basketball and then running and then swimming. And it was literally just like my life for the first, you know, 10, 15 years was just me playing sport after sport after sport. And I honestly, I just thought that was normal. Like that's just the, who I am and that's just what something I love to do. Right. So I tried to keep up that level of activity all throughout high school and all throughout college. And then by the time I hit 22, all of a sudden I started to feel really, really tired. I'm, I'm talking like, like so tired that it was mind boggling how challenging it was to use my body. And in addition to that, I got really dehydrated too, like very dehydrated to the point where I would drink a glass of water, like a, you know, a tall 16 ounce glass of water. I drink it, I put it down. And 30 seconds later, I was like, wow, I think I'm thirstier. So then I would drink another glass of water, put it down. And then two minutes later, I was like, I just got thirstier. And then I would drink another glass. And it was just like, it was on repeat. So uh, I picked up the phone and I called my sister and she's a doctor of osteopathy. So she's a family practice medical physician and she's, she's sharp as a tack. And I explained all the symptomology to her and she instantly, she picked that out of a hat. She goes, Cyrus, that's type one diabetes. She started crying. She was like, drop everything you're doing right now. Go straight to the health center. This is no joke. And I was like, wait, what, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? She's like, I don't have time. Just go to the health center. So I show up at the health center. They, they check my blood glucose. When the nurse leaves the room, two minutes later, she comes back with a finger stick blood glucose reading. And she looks at, she, she looks at me, she goes, how did you get here? And I was like, I walked. And she's I was like, why was that a bad idea? And she's like, we need to get you to the ER now. And I was like, oh, can someone please explain to me what's going on? And she goes, yeah, your blood glucose is supposed to be, you know, somewhere between about 80 and 130 or 70, 130. Your glucose is in the 600s right now. You're six times higher than you're supposed to be. And I was like, uh, this is all Greek to me. I don't know what any of this stuff means. Like, did I do something wrong? Like, explain to me. So long story short, I ended up getting transferred to the hospital. And there in the hospital, they basically gave me an, an IV of saline to um, get me more hydrated. And then they started giving me an IV of insulin to try and bring my blood glucose down. And while I was there, over the course of 24 hours, they explained to me that I had not one, not two, but three autoimmune conditions. And all three of those autoimmune conditions had sort of set in over the course of approximately six months. So the first one was Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, which is basically an autoimmune thyroid disorder. The second one is alopecia universalis, which is basically just like complete hair loss. Like I used to have hair just like yours. You know, I used to have like a, you know, I used to shave it on a number one and I used to just kind of try and stay like nice and trimmed. And I lost my hair on my head. I lost anything on my, my, my facial hair. I lost my chest hair. I lost my arm hair. You name it, it's all gone. And then the third one was type one diabetes. So I was afraid that I had done something wrong. I literally was like, just tell me what I'm doing to myself that is causing all these problems and I will stop it and I will stop it right now. But nobody had the answer. And so the doctors at that time basically were like, listen, we can't really, we can give you insulin. And we can teach you how to check your blood glucose. And like, other than that, we can't really do anything for you. Um, but we, we do recommend that you eat a low carbohydrate diet, because if you do that, then it'll, it'll do two things. Number one, it'll keep your blood glucose nice and low. And number two, it'll also keep your insulin use low and it'll prevent you from using a lot more insulin into the future. And that's a good thing because it'll make your life easier. So I was like, all right, you're telling a 22 year old guy that I get to eat more meat and more cheese and more dairy products. Like sign me up. I'm in. Let's, let's do this. So basically for the first year of living with type one diabetes, I did exactly what they told me to do. I was eating, you know, turkey burgers and fish and lean meat and dairy products and peanut butter and olive oil. And I was trying to eliminate all these things called quote unquote carbs. Mm -hmm. Right. So I wasn't eating very many fruits. I wasn't eating potatoes. I tried to limit my intake of pasta and rice. And as a result of that, the promise again was that my glucose would stay low and my insulin use would stay low. But in the first two months of living that way, my blood glucose became a disaster. Wow. I mean, it was, it was high to begin with. And then I got some semblance of control. And then from that point, moment onwards, it was just like this ping pong. It would just go high, low, high, low, high, low every single day. And it just becomes mentally and physically exhausting when that happens. And so on any given moment of the day, I would check my glucose and it could be, you know, uh, uh, an 80, which is a good number, or it could be a 420. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? Like, I'm, I'm following the directions. I'm doing exactly what, I'm, what I've been told to do, but this isn't working. At a certain point, I recognized that not only was my glucose hard to control, not only was my insulin use going up, and my insulin use had actually doubled 
from like 25 units a day all the way upwards of 50 units a day, which is way too much insulin for someone of my height and weight. Not only that, but from an athletic perspective, it felt like I was living in the body of an 85 year old man. Okay. I grew up as a soccer player and I like, I love spending time in the gym. Like I could do that all day long every day and I'm a happy guy. But when I would go play a game of soccer, it wouldn't take me 24 hours to recover. It wouldn't take me two days. It wouldn't take me three days. It would take me four days to recover from one game of soccer. And that had never been true before. Then when I would go to the gym and I would try and, you know, lift some weights and do a 30 minute weight training session, I would spend the next three or four days lying on the couch because I was so debilitated sore that I couldn't really like muster up the courage to go back and do it again. So that really frustrated me. Long story short, I ended up switching my diet. I changed over to becoming a plant-based eater because I was just presented with that option. And I was like, all right, well, I don't care. Like I'll do whatever, just make me feel better, right? And there was a gentleman named Dr. Doug Graham who um, he basically teaches people how to transition to a plant-based diet. And he took me under his wing and he said, listen, I'm going to show you how to eat a 100% plant-based diet and you're going to feel like a million bucks. So under his supervision, I switched over to eating a plant-based diet, literally cold turkey overnight. And I gave up all animal products and basically started eating a fully plant-based diet, having no idea what it was actually going to do. And in the first week, I noticed that my blood glucose fell very, very quickly. And it fell significantly. It fell so rapidly, actually, that I had to start giving myself less and less and less and less and less insulin. So in the first week of, of eating the way that he had described, I was eating a very large quantity of carbohydrate energy, which is exactly the opposite of what the doctors had told me to do. I mean, I was eating very large plates of bananas and mangoes and figs, and I was just like, this is... This is insane how much stuff I'm eating, how much you know carbohydrate and glucose I'm getting, and yet my insulin use went down and down and down. And within the first week, I was able to go from using like 45 units of insulin per day all the way back down to 25 units in, the, in one week, which is a massive change in a short period of time. So I ended up putting myself back to graduate school because I was so interested in what was actually happening under the surface, and I wanted to be able to use science to basically explain what was happening in me and then also see if there was a way that we could use this this methodology to help other people. Let's stop there, because I think that's where we're gonna go next when I get Robbie's info. All right, Robbie, hit me up with the foundation of your journey. Okay, so my story is similar to Cyrus. So I was diagnosed with type one diabetes when I was 12 years old, just about to turn 13. So I've been living with type one now for over 22 years. And my older brother also had type one diabetes. He was diagnosed nine years prior to me. So I basically self-diagnosed myself. I told my mom, I'm thirsty all the time. I'm going to the bathroom all the time. I think I have diabetes just like Steve. She said, no, no, don't be silly. You don't have diabetes. I said, okay, fine. I kept on living. Eventually, my parents, they were in Florida. We were home in Minnesota at the time. My mom called to check in on me. Said, hey, how are things going? I said, look, I couldn't sleep last night. I was cramping. She said, okay, go upstairs. Use your brother's blood glucose meter and test yourself. I tested, I was well above 400. You're not supposed to be above 140 really as a non-diabetic. My brother said right then and there, you have type one diabetes, pack your bags, you're gonna be in the hospital for a few nights. So we go to the general doctor, they give me the official diagnosis, then I go to the hospital to get some insulin. And I remember my parents coming back the next day and saying, look, this is just an inconvenience. You can still live the life you want, all your dreams can come true. And that's really the way I was raised. It's just like, you know what, just take care of it, no big deal do whatever you want. So my parents wanted to make sure we had the best medical care possible. And they took us to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I had a team of doctors, an endocrinologist, a nutritionist, a psychologist, and nobody there said anything about reversing insulin resistance or using diet to improve your blood glucose, like using a, a protocol that can help your health now and reduce the long-term complications. There was no talk of that. And we have to understand the number one cause of all cause of death for all forms of diabetes is heart disease. So we don't mm. actually die of high blood glucose screens. We die of the complications. So I proceed to follow this guidance from the Mayo Clinic and it's really standard education, just, you know, meat, pretty much low carbohydrate, but really their main focus at that time was we just want you to be normal, you know, just be like your friends. Like, don't feel like this is going to, you know, cause a hassle in your life and just take insulin to eat whatever you want. That was basically their teaching. 
And, you know, they said, oh, make sure to have a fruit at night. So my mom really followed the guidelines and said, hey, look, here's your can of mandarin oranges with high fructose corn syrup and all this added stuff. That was your fruit for the night. Anytime I had strawberries, I had to put powdered sugar on top. <laughs> that was just the wow. way I grew up. Totally yeah. I mean, it time. sounds really good. I'm not going to lie. I mean, <laughs> we've all been there before. <laughs> we've all been there. No question. <laughs> So I proceed to follow all this stuff, and I developed some standard American diet symptoms. I was a competitive tennis player. I was oh. actually I was number one in the Midwest, so for 10s, 12s, and 14s. Do you still play? Uh, a little bit. Not as much as I should. I'll challenge you to a match. Okay, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. That'll be fun. Yes, it um, will. <laughs> so I, but then when I moved to Florida, I was only top 50. It's a whole other ball game when you go to Florida. You know, that's horrible. <laughs> 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 so, but what was frustrating is I had plantar fasciitis. So oh. I had this painful condition in my feet. I had to wear these big blue boots at night and that was no fun. So I also developed cystic acne, which was really frustrating as a teenager. Okay. I mean, it was bad. I had to do pills and creams. I'd go to the doctor. They do like laser treatments. Eventually they put me on Accutane, which is the most serious drug you can possibly take for acne. My mom had to sign a waiver because some people had committed suicide on that drug. So it was kind of serious. Then I also had allergies. I would get sick year round. No matter what I was doing, I was still getting sick. So I took Claritin D, I took Nasonex. I wasn't the picture of health. And so in high school, I was at Barnes and Noble. Okay. I was looking for spark notes. People listening might know that's kind of like a short version of your stuff you're supposed to learn if you don't want to read the whole book. So I'm doing yeah, exactly. what a high school student does. All right. And there's a book that just like calls, calls my name. It's called Kevin Trudeau's Natural Cures They Don't Want You to Know About. Okay. You, do you remember that book, Sean? This guy was on I infomercials. I don't remember that one. No. No. Okay. I don't remember it, that some of your listeners will definitely remember. All right. This guy, he was infomercials. He had, it was a purple book. He was selling millions of copies. I am not recommending this book. All right. This guy got put in jail. There was fraud involved. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> recommending it. It's just that the book planted a seed in my mind. It changed my life. And it, it gave me the idea that if I take care of myself from the inside out, maybe I can reverse type 1 diabetes. Maybe. This has never been done, Sean, just to be clear. Like, we still haven't solved this problem. Uh, there, we don't have a cure for type 1 diabetes. But I was on this mission now. You know what? Hey, look, if Roger Bannister was the first person to run a four-minute mile and then a bunch of people started to do that, you know what? Somebody's going to be the first person to figure this out. We're going to figure out type 1 diabetes. I believe it's going to happen in our lifetime. And we're going to regenerate beta cells because what's happening in type 1 is Cyrus's pancreas, my pancreas, we don't produce insulin. It's, it's an autoimmune condition and our pancreas has been damaged and we're just not producing insulin. So what we need to happen is we need the antibodies to diminish and then we need our own internal stem cells or external stem cells to produce new beta cells that can produce more insulin. That's what we need to happen. But anyways, the point is I go down this path. I will do anything to make myself the healthiest person I can possibly be. And I'm like, I, I'm going to heal type 1 diabetes and nothing's going to stop me. So I try all these different things. I try a Weston A. Price Foundation diet where I'm eating grass-fed beef. I was having raw milk. And you can't sell raw milk to humans. So I would go to the store and I would buy raw milk that was supposed to be for cats. And then I would consume that raw milk. I mean, look, I'm doing crazy things, Sean. Crazy Hold, things. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold, hold, hold. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. I heard the word cat. I know that a lot of listeners might want you to just continue, but I know there's also a lot of listeners that's like, wait a minute. So you go to the store literally to get milk for cats. That's exactly right, Sean. That's exactly right. Wait, did you find this in that purple book? <laughs> that one was not in the purple book. Okay, that, all right. A, that's in a yellow book called Nourishing Traditions. That's where you'll learn that one. But again, not recommending that book either. So how did cat milk taste? I just need to know this. <laughs> okay, so at this point, these, these guys are teaching that their point is, hey, look, pasteurization is a problem, all right? It, it, mm. the, it was a long time ago. We didn't have pasteurization. It was actually much healthier to consume it if it was like straight from the cow, like that type of energy. And so right. this milk, it was very thick, right? It was like full fat milk, essentially. And um, I would say it tasted just fine. Like if you like milk, you're probably going to like the milk for, for, for cats. I don't like milk, so. I don't like milk anymore either. If you want, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, fun alternative plant-based milks you can have these days if you're looking for that. Yeah, I'm doing crazy stuff. Next crazy thing is to do a plant-based ketogenic diet where 
all I eat is greens and nuts and seeds and, and oil. and all. I, I couldn't have bell peppers because bell peppers were too high in carbohydrate energy. You couldn't have too many carrots. Like that's too much carbs if you want to stay really, really keto on this, on this program. So I do that. And this time, at this point, I'm a freshman at the University of Florida. I'm following this diet. I'm losing weight. I have no energy. My favorite thing to do is pick up basketball. I love playing pickup basketball in college. I like started being like just having no energy. Like I had no incentive to play. Like I just like didn't even want to go because I was just terrible. And so I'm like, this is not good. Like this is going south. I got to do something different. I go back to a natural path that I'd seen in the past. And she's like, you know what? Maybe you need chelation therapy. I'm like, okay. I mean, look, you want, you want, maybe I can get rid of some heavy metals. Like, I don't know. Like, I'll try it. But before I did that, I heard the same guru that taught Cyrus. I heard Doug Graham on a podcast. And it's fun to say that while on a podcast. You know, maybe we can change a life for, uh, here today as well. But that podcast changed my life. And this guy was saying, look, he, in that episode, he specifically said how eating fruits and vegetables in a certain way could actually help you detoxify and like get rid of heavy metals. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'd much rather eat fruits and vegetables than go and do this chelation therapy and sit in a chair and spend all this money. Like I'm, I miss fruits. I haven't been able to have that on this plant-based keto diet. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to give this guy a try. And I start learning from him. I buy his book and Cyrus is one of the testimonials in the back of the book. It's the book. It's, now this one I do recommend. This one's called the 80, 10, 10 diet. You could pick that up. But first pick up our book and then pick up this one, okay? Yeah, we'll pick up your book first, for yeah, sure. Okay, good. <laughs> so I read this book. I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. And I start working with this guy, Doug. And it gets crazy, Sean. He's telling me to eat nothing but bananas for the first week. And I'm living with type 1 diabetes. I'm like, how's this going to turn out? And so this is right around Christmas. The book comes out December 2006. I remember going downstairs to Christmas dinner. I have a plate with a pyramid of bananas, like literally there's like five and then four and then three and then two, like a pyramid of bananas peeled. And my family is just shaking their head being like, oh my goodness, like this is just another phase. This guy's going to, he won't be doing this for much longer, but hey, we're 16 years later and I'm still eating pyramids of bananas. Okay. <laughs> this one worked. Okay. And just like Cyrus, I start eating way more carbohydrate energy and my insulin sensitivity goes through the roof. I saw a 900% change in my insulin sensitivity. I use a physiologically normal amount of insulin, approximately 30 units per day. I eat over 700 grams of total carbohydrate per day. My A1C is 5.3%. My time and range on my Dexcom G6 CGM is over 90%, whereas most type 1s are approximately 55%. So I'm showing that I, I have this personal experience, like, wow, like this works. And I get this insight of like, wow, if I know how to reverse insulin resistance in my own body, then just like we opened up this show saying how, you know, diabetes can be reversible. That's what we're talking about. Pre-diabetes type two, when you reverse insulin resistance, you reverse those forms of diabetes. And that's over 90% of all people living with diabetes. Wow. Back to Cyrus. Do you remember where you were going to pick up? Yeah, I was basically just gonna talk about the fact that I wanted science because we both had these awesome personal stories and I was like, wait a minute, hold on, let's put some science to this. So I put myself, I, I was like, I want to go get a PhD in the subject because I mean, why not, right? And so I go to UC Berkeley for five years and I get a PhD in uh, what's called nutritional biochemistry, which is like super nerd nutrition. And while I'm there, I'm, my mind is just getting blown because I was given the opportunity to basically become an expert in insulin resistance and try and figure out what is insulin resistance? What, how can you cause it? How can you create it? And then how can you reverse it? And so we did experiment after experiment after experiment in mice and in rats and then also in some humans as well to try and figure out what are the things that we can do to create it and how can we rescue it once it has already been created? Here's the kicker, okay? The entire time I was there, I was, I was kind of operating or at the beginning, I was operating under this idea that in order to create insulin resistance, which is the precursor to pre-diabetes, which is the precursor to type two diabetes. Well, the, the world has taught me that carbs cause diabetes. It's all about sugar, right? It's either about table sugar or high fructose corn syrup or, you know, quote unquote, refined carbohydrates. So what if I were to just feed these, uh, you know, these laboratory mice and rats with this like refined, 
uh, sugary substances, is that enough to get them to become insulin resistant? So I started reading paper after paper after paper to try and figure out, well, you know, is that the right thing to do? And it turns out that that's not the right thing to do. And researchers have discovered or had discovered uh, as, as early as 1922, I'm talking a hundred years ago, that the way to induce insulin resistance is to feed animals a high fat diet, not a high sugar diet. And I was like, wait, what? What are you talking about? And so you would see this over and over and over again in these, in these papers that date all the way back to the 1920s and then ones that were repeated in the 50s and 70s and 90s and then you know even modern day papers. And they basically, all of them say the same thing. In order to induce insulin resistance in, fill in the blank, mice or rats or monkeys or humans, we fed a diet that was high in fat and usually containing something on the order of 60 to 70% total calories as fat, which if you take a look at what people eat is a ketogenic diet, right? It's a, it's a very low carbohydrate diet, right? So I'm sitting here thinking to myself, wait a minute, you're telling me that that's how you actually induce insulin resistance in these animals and in humans, but yet that's the exact diet that people in the, you know, the, the general public is being told to consume. Right. So all of a sudden it like my, my head just started to spin. Cause I was like, wait, what the heck is going on here? Right. So I went deeper and deeper and deeper into this, this world of biology and recognized that the very thing that induces insulin resistance and then can eventually lead to prediabetes and type two diabetes is the very thing that all of these quote unquote health experts are telling people to do in today's world. Now, the reason why it becomes a little complicated is because when you eat a diet that is high in fat, temporarily in the short term, it'll suppress your blood glucose values. Meaning if you were to start eating a high fat diet today, you would look on a blood glucose meter and your numbers would actually improve, right? But it appears as though it's a good thing. And people are sort of coerced into believing like, oh shoot, my, blood, my fasting blood glucose went down and my A1C is coming down. These are all good things, right? But what people don't realize is that the research demonstrates that people who eat high fat diets end up developing insulin resistance today and that insulin resistance then serves as the foundation for more chronic diseases in general including what robbie said earlier heart disease the number one risk factor for people living with any form of diabetes number two cancer the number two risk factor number three fatty liver disease number four chronic kidney disease and now number five dementia and alzheimer's disease right so what ends up happening is that in the short term, your blood glucose control improves, but in the long term, your chronic disease risk goes up significantly. And here's the thing, people just don't know that. So it's not their fault. And what we're here to teach people and what we wrote about extensively inside of our book and what we tried to back up with, you know, more than 800 scientific references is the fact that just because your short term results may look good, may look better, does not mean that your long-term results are going to be good. The only thing that, you, that what, what we recommend people to do is to evaluate a diet based off of both the short-term effects and the long-term effects. And if you're only paying attention to the short-term and you're forgetting or neglecting the long-term, you're doing yourself a disservice. And that's what the high fat, you know, all of these high fat diets teach people is let's prioritize the short-term rapid weight loss, rapid blood glucose reduction, blood pressure reduction, yada, yada, yada. But they don't look in the long term and recognize that it's unsustainable and it can actually make you more unhealthy into the future. It reminds me of when I remember I was like 23 and I was working at a, a corporate health center and it was when the Atkins diet was like, and everyone would come in and, you know, they would take my classes and, you know, I would train people and we would do the whole blood pressure thing and they would, and everybody started coming in like, I'm doing Atkins, I'm doing Atkins. And, and, you know, it was like the thing, it was like, just eat meat. And then you found out people's hearts weren't handling that well at all. And then it was like this huge reversal. All right. So Robbie saw Cyrus in the back of a book testimonial. How did you two come together, how you created your book and your programs that really help people move forward. So tell me, tell me the connection story. 
Yeah, so we were both giving a lecture in Oakland, I believe, and Cyrus was around that area. And Doug had told us, hey, you guys should know each other, you should connect, but we never really got in touch until we met in person. And at that time, I mean, Cyrus, he was doing personal training, he was doing coaching, he was doing all this stuff. I was working at Forks Over Knives, and Cyrus was like, you know, when are you going to leave? Like, when are you going to get me to leave Forks Over Knives? And uh, eventually, uh, 2016, you know, we started doing a little bit of, like, dating each other and practicing uh, working together as, as, as partners and doing some programs, and it went well. And then 2017, we said, you know what, like, let's stop doing, like, our individual thing. Let's, let's create one go-to place where anybody who's living with diabetes can go to really learn, okay, I want to follow a plant-based diet. I want to execute this. I want to reverse insulin resistance. I want to completely get rid of pre-diabetes. I want to get rid of type 2 diabetes. You know, what do I do? So we created that. I mean, in the movie Forks Over Knives, which if listeners haven't seen, you should check it out. It's a great movie. There's, you know, two people in that movie who reverse type 2 diabetes during the documentary. But if you watched it and you said, hey, you know what? I want to do this. There wasn't one go-to destination. There wasn't one website, one book. Like, okay, like I'm going to learn all the details, all the nuances, which there are a lot of when it comes to diabetes. And just like Cyrus was saying, that that confusion around, well, if I don't eat very many carbs now, my blood sugar goes down, but then I still have problems down the road. Like, it's just confusing. And so we decided we're going to create we're going to create a coaching program. And that's what we did. So that's been our main focus: is giving people the opportunity to come in and get that nuanced support because everybody's different. Every situation is different. How you're going to respond to food is different. And we help people not only through the transition, but then a maintenance plan that they can actually sustain for the rest of their lives. And that's been our focus. And so that program did so well. We had the opportunity to write a book with Penguin Random House. That book came out in 2020. Great reviews. Check them out on Amazon. A lot of popularity. Became a New York Times bestseller. And we're having a lot of fun continuing to help people through, again, the coaching, but through a lot of education in the book, in webinars, you know, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. We have our own podcast. You name it. But um, our real focus is bringing evidence-based information to people and then helping them implement it through, you know, again, evidence-based guidelines and what you can do to actually make change sustainable, actually make these new habits in your life. And that's what we're doing. That's amazing. In order for people to really trust and believe in the fact that something is going to work, they have to find that consistency. And I think that obviously you have an incredible program that in some ways either taking people on a journey or kind of handholding, but I guess I'll ask Cyrus, you know, as I mean, you were both athletes and, and wild and crazy like I was. So I get it. How do you feel like you're able to help whether somebody has diabetes or not find that consistency combined with I know this is going to be a really tough question. I love and appreciate science. And so how do you get these people to connect these two things like this is science This is going to work. But here's a consistency that's going to kind of like make this snowball effect together so that you can have those long term results, because both of you being diagnosed 20 plus years ago or so and still being able to eat that pyramid of bananas. Have you found like a thing that's like that through line to help people, you know, find that commitment? Yeah. Okay. You bring up a really good point here, which is that sustainability is key because like you can make a number of changes today, but if you can't stick with them in the long term, then, you know, it doesn't really make that much sense. Okay. So here's the way that I think about it. When you change your lifestyle, okay, there's a number of things that you change. You can change the way that you eat. You can change the way that you do fitness. You can change the frequency with which you do fitness. You can start intermittent fasting. You can start a meditation practice. You can change the way you communicate with people and the list goes on. So there's a whole bunch of things that you can do. And within a short period of time, you can get overwhelmed because each one of those requires a lot of thought and attention and detail, right? So when we teach people how to change their lifestyle, we actively slow people down and we try and teach people don't make too many changes too quickly. Cause if you do, even though you're excited at the beginning, you're likely to bite off more than you can chew pun intended. 
and eventually get to a point where you're like, oh my God, this is, this is work. This is challenging. This is too hard, right? And the last thing that I want you to feel is though changing your lifestyle so that you can become healthier actually feels like homework because then it doesn't, it kind of has the fun out of it, right? So what we teach people how to do is basically make what feel like, you know, kind of like microscopic changes to their diet. And rather than trying to integrate a fully plant-based diet over the course of, I don't know, a week or two weeks, we're like, no, 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 no. Take six months. I don't even care. There's no rush, right? I want you to literally just make a change to one meal. That's it. Just change your breakfast and eat your breakfast in this new way and just stick with that until you feel good about it, until it feels you know how big it has to be and where are you going to get the food and do you like eating bananas or maybe you want mangoes maybe you want chickpeas instead you figure it out we'll give you a bunch of options just figure that out once you feel comfortable with that change then you may move on to the next change then you can start changing your lunch and then eventually your snacks and then eventually your dinner and then eventually your dessert and again if that takes you six months it's totally fine i got no problem with that right the reason that that works is because small changes that occur over the course of long time periods end up sticking. But large changes that happen quickly don't end up sticking. And we've seen this over and over and over again. I mean, there's literally books written about this. And we're just trying to sort of capitalize on that psychology and make sure people understand that a little bit of change today is going to translate to a lot of bit of change in the future. The last thing I'll say is about the sustainability piece is that we encourage people to make choices that are likely to be sustainable into the future. But I like to think of sustainability as not something that you try and achieve. It's something that it's a side effect. So if you can kind of wrap your head around the idea that sustainability in anything you do usually comes from the, that thing improving the quality of your life, right? And if I were to give you any task, whether it's fitness or whether it's changing your diet or whether it's changing your communication habits, it doesn't matter. If, if it improves your life, you're probably going to do it again and you're going to do it again and again and again and again and again, right? So if you can take these little bite-sized habits and compound them on one another over the course of time, then the sustainability is likely to just happen and you don't have to work for it because you're improving the quality of your life and you're enjoying yourself. And then before you know it, you're six months into it and you're like, hell, this is my new lifestyle. How did that happen? I absolutely love that because I do feel that people put pressure on themselves because of someone else's already success. You know, like we have, you probably did insanity, Robbie, because you saw the before and after pictures. Or maybe it was because <laughs> you saw me and I was so nice. <laughs> but, <laughs> that was what it was, bro. I know, I know. I didn't want to say that, but I, you know, I figured <laughs> I know the truth. That takes me to the next question, which is obviously Mastering Diabetes, the book, but also the coaching program. And I kind of would love for you to tell me, I'm sure it has a lot of what Cyrus said as well, but it's like, how does the book tie into the coaching program? And, you know, what is really unique about both for people and the success you've seen as people go through this process? Yeah. So the coaching is really focused on the personalized nuances that each person brings to the table. And a lot of people come to us with more than just diabetes, right? There's high blood pressure. There's oftentimes a lot of gut challenges. So they start, you know, people increase their fiber intake. There's some things that happen. And when you're trying to do it on your own and you're experiencing symptoms that you just can't really understand, you kind of get lost. And sometimes you're like, ah, oh, this isn't working for me. I'm just going to go to something else. But if you have a coach who's been there, done that over and over and over again, it's like, oh, I know exactly why that's happening. Here's what we're going to do to address it. It gives you a lot more confidence and a lot of reassurance every step of the way. So it's really about... The book lays the foundation. It has a lot of science, okay? So just like Cyrus said, over 800 uh, citations in this book. We do provide meal plans in there. So you can follow the meal plans. It's one week at a time. So there's two 21-day meal plans, depending on how insulin resistant you are. So the book has a quiz in there that you can take. If you can figure out, okay, which meal plan should I start with so I don't see a bunch of blood glucose spikes when I'm starting out. And so the book has that foundation. But then it's like, okay, you know, I got family members 
And uh, how am I going to feed them? How are we going to do this diet with, with the kids not necessarily on board? Or maybe your husband's not on board yet. Your partner's not with you. Like, that's okay. Like, there's ways to get around that. Let's talk about it. Let's, like Cyrus was talking about, how do you improve your communication? This is stuff, it goes beyond just diabetes numbers, right? Like, there's, there's a lot of communication. How do you navigate restaurants? How are you going to travel? Okay, wow, we got, you know, holidays right around the corner. How are you going to navigate those situations? And the accountability is huge. I mean, you know that, Sean, in your industry. I mean, accountability is big time. Once you've made a commitment, you've invested some resources, and I want this result, our job is to coach you to the result that you want. You decide. We're not the food police. We're not telling you what to do. We're just going to help you understand the consequences so you get the goal that you want. And so oh, it's yeah. really that, that interaction, the you know, the coaches and the clients create a really, really close relationship, a close bond. People work in our program for, you know, six to 12 months. We're all about longevity and really setting people up for long-term success. So do you guys coach people who don't have type 1 diabetes? Because it feels like it's a program that other people could kind of jump into. Is the way you eat fine for someone who doesn't have type 1 diabetes? Yeah. So, okay. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up here because we're both living with type one diabetes as we explained, but the mastering diabetes and, and what we've researched and what we've sort of learned and applied to thousands of people over the course of time is not just about type one. Type one is a very small component of what we do. We help people mainly living with pre-diabetes and type two diabetes because that's just the majority of the diabetes population. And then in addition to that, we also help people who have gestational diabetes and then people who have what's called type 1.5 diabetes, which is basically an adult onset version of type 1 diabetes. Okay? So any form of diabetes, we got you covered. We know the game inside and out, and we can help for sure. But then your question is, well, what if you don't have diabetes, right? What if you're just a, a regular person trying to improve their health? And the answer is we also help a lot of people who are trying to lose weight because weight loss tends to be you know, something that a lot of people are looking forward to. So when you reverse insulin resistance using a plant-based diet the way that we describe, weight loss becomes almost inevitable. It happens in the overwhelming majority of all of the people that we help. As a result of that, we think of weight loss as being basically like a really convenient side effect of you know reversing insulin resistance, right? So technically speaking, right now it's only a diabetes coaching program with you know an emphasis on weight loss. But into the future, I can't really go into too much detail about this, but into the future, we are going to be opening other programs that are going to be helping people that are living with other conditions that are outside of diabetes. So the answer is, if you're interested, then I would recommend maybe, I don't know, get on our mailing, our, our email list at masteringdiabetes.org, and we will definitely keep you abreast of these opportunities as they roll around. And I'm intentionally being a little bit vague right now because I have to be, but things are likely to happen in the future for sure. <laughs> but no, I love that. I think it's great. I think just even people, they're going to listen to this and be like, wow, like this is extremely uh, informative for their own personal health, even if they don't have type 1 diabetes or any form of it. I think my next question is, I'm not anywhere near as bad as I was, but someone who would feel symptom in Google. What are just some of the things that people can feel if they weren't feeling that dehydration that you were feeling, Cyrus, or like those little things that people need to look out for? If we can help them, you know, kind of like find those symptoms before it gets a little as bad as yours was at the time. Sean, I'm glad you asked this question because insulin resistance, I'm going to go out and guess, applies to about 90% of the people who are listening to this podcast, whether you have diabetes or not. Okay. So what you have to understand is insulin resistance is the cause of prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. And in the U.S. alone, we have over, over 100 million people living with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Over 80 million have prediabetes and don't even know it. But before you get to prediabetes, you're insulin resistant. So that's, that's the precursor to getting prediabetes. And that's a vast majority of our population. So if you have any challenges right now losing weight, the information in our book and how to maximize insulin sensitivity applies to you. If you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, fatty liver disease, chronic kidney disease, retinopathy, neuropathy, 
you're having some cognitive problems, also now known as type 3 diabetes, if any of that applies to you, if you have any skin challenges, this is a warning sign. These are all warning signs that you may be living with insulin resistance, and it's time to turn that around because the sooner you take care of it, the faster you can actually get this completely out of your life and prevent the complications of actually becoming type 2 and letting it progress to a point where it can reverse it, which is possible. But this applies to a large percent of the population, just like Cyrus said. That's why you know, there will be other opportunities for people to come into our program under you know, different titles um, because insulin resistance applies to just about the entire population. What is your definition of trust and believe? That's a great question. I don't think anybody's ever asked me that before. Was my definition of trust and believe? In order to trust and believe something, I have to have a sort of willing suspension of disbelief in the back of my mind that that what I'm doing is gonna either be good for me or good for other people or both. I always approach things from the perspective of how can I add value to my life and to other people's lives. And as long as that's my guiding light, then it becomes easy to trust and believe in things that are likely to work out into the future. So it's a long winded way of me basically saying that as long as the thing that I am trying to trust and believe in is likely to work, you know, for me and hopefully for other people, I'm sold. That's not long-winded. That's really powerful, actually. Because I think a lot of people get stuck in this tunnel of like, like, am I going the right way? But I think that it's like the fear of judgment, right? Like, as a gay guy growing up, I'm like, oh my gosh, people are going to judge me. They're going to judge me for who I am. But at the same time, now I'm living, you know, I have a husband, I have kids, and I'm adding value to a lot of other people who are gay and they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I could have that until I saw you. So it makes it, it's like, okay, like I know these people are going to shun me for doing what I'm doing, but those stories of value. And I think it's really amazing because it is what, you know, I'll speak specifically to Cyrus right now. It's like, it, it's exactly what you're doing. You're adding value to people's lives. And so that was really great. So thank you. Not to put thank the pressure you. on you, Robbie. <laughs> But it's your turn. You better impress me. Just, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, that's too good. That's too good. So you know the question. Yeah. I mean, so trust. When I think of trust and belief, like my mind goes automatically to the scientific method, to research. We believe in science here. And of course, like I'm out here trying, I'm trying to reverse type 1 diabetes. I'm going to do all this crazy stuff. Like sometimes the science isn't there yet. So you have to like try new things and that's cool. That's fine. But just acknowledge that when you're doing that. But what we're doing, you know, the program we put together, the book we wrote together, it's 100% evidence-based. Like, this is just science. And the scientific method is, like, as rigorous as it gets. You know, looking at meta-analyses and, you know, double-blind control study, like, all that stuff is real. Like, it's, it's meaningful. And learning how to, you know, interpret science and, and do research, like, that's how you trust and you believe. And that gives you the confidence to then, okay, you know what? I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do this because I have that foundation. I've understood why this is the good thing to do. And that's, it's huge for people with diabetes because the condition is confusing. And you've got to have that, that basic knowledge. You have to trust and believe in the program to then have the confidence to proceed and stick with it through the trials and the tribulations that will happen. But again, you know, you have the science, you'll trust and you'll believe. That's great too. And I think the reason why is, you know, and I'm not trying to get crazy political, but I just want to say that with the pandemic happening, it's like a lot of people out there try to challenge science and a lot of people became scientists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if we like eliminate any of that noise, the science is really how you're feeling in your body. You know, it's just like both of you were feeling something it is science. Like we got here from a sperm and an egg. This is science, you know, and, and this happened, like things happen to each of us here talking today. And so I also think that's really great. So before I let you go, cause I'm actually letting you go. Cause I could like talk to you guys all day. 
I know you gave us, you know, your website on how to find you, but what is, is there a way people can interact with you like right away or is it just following your social channels or a website? What is kind of the best way for people to get, you know, a larger piece of each of you? It's a great question. I, I don't know the answer. Robbie, what's the answer? <laughs> <laughs> the answer? You hit us up on any platform you want to, and you'll get plenty of Cyrus and Robbie. All right. I mean, you, you DM us on Instagram. We're going to be there for you. It's at Mastering Diabetes. Check out our podcast. The book is available everywhere. We read our own audiobook, which was super fun. So that's on Audible. Oh, cool. And we, we added some extra stuff in there, a little bit of updated science. So the audiobook is great. Um, and you know, if anybody wants coaching, you just go to masteringdiabetes.org. You click on personalized coaching. We're here to help you. Um, whatever you need, the books available at libraries. Like we just want to help people wherever they're at. And, uh, we want everybody to reach their health and wellness goals. Well, thank you guys so much. I know that this is going to change people's lives and enhance people's lives. You now have one extra follower. Thank you guys so much for being on the show. Cyrus, I'll challenge you to any sport, any day of the week. I'm very competitive. And Robbie, whenever we get that tennis match in, I'm ready. So just, it's on. just let me know where y'all at. <laughs> and I'm down. You're talking to two, two extremely competitive <laughs> I know I so You said the right words. But thanks a ton, Sean. It's been, it's been a pleasure meeting you. And um, I, I appreciate you giving us an opportunity to sort of talk the the science of insulin resistance and provide hope for people because there's a lot to be had and uh keep doing what you're doing man you're changing so many lives and we appreciate it thank you guys so much i appreciate it